Welcome back everyone to another episode of Grow Your Path to Wellness. If this is your first time listening, my co-host Amanda and I, we host a new wellness guest every week and our new episodes typically go live every Sunday. In case you missed it last week, we had um, Kimberly Anderson. She returned and uh, we talked about queerness and Mormonism. So we truly appreciated Kimberly's vulnerability um, and sharing some of her stories and experiences tied to that topic. This week, we welcome Chris Seam, and we'll be discussing the importance of, as well as some ways that we can destigmatize. This one's a, a mouthful, but um, <laughs> destigmatizing mental health crisis through um, stabilization with going to like uh, the hospital. So welcome, Chris, and thank you for your uh, vulnerability and being here as well. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Chris. Um, You know, I'm diagnosed with PTSD, and so I'm excited to do do this. We're so excited to have you. Whenever you asked, I was like, of course. Like, and it's such a, and we hadn't touched on this topic yet, so I know you, something that we're all very passionate about, Chris is on TikTok with us, we interact, Amanda and I and Chris a lot. So but we appreciate you. Chris, I also love your shirt. Um, somebody I got too. <laughs> my baby a shirt that says, could I be any cuter in front of oh. Oh, the wording. So, cute. so I appreciate your shirt. Um, and before we get started into these bulletins, just bulletins, bullets, because this is um, a, mm-hmm. a delicate subject, we want to make sure that we let people know that there could be some things that activate some things for you um, as we talk about hospitalization, crisis services, maybe suicidal or homicidal thoughts or things like that. So just a little um, preparation for anyone planning to tune in, um, be prepared for that. Um, Now, what do we mean? Because those of us that um, are either consumers of services or those of us that are uh, providers of services really know what crisis stabilization means, but other folks might not. So, Chris, do you mind just kind of explaining what crisis stabilization means? Um, yes. For me, um, I'm trying to find the words. Um, you know, I was in crisis over a period, I'll say about a month, and <laughs> You know, things were getting worse, not better. And so for me, it was just being admitted to the hospital to stabilize me and adjust my meds. Okay. And and when we say, when I was, when we say I was in crisis, and again, you don't share anything at all about, like, details for what that looked like for you, but what kind of triggered for you and your, your therapist to say, like, I think that, I think this could be labeled as crisis. What were you noticing for yourself? And again, please don't feel like you have to share details. Um, yes, I was, you know, having suicidal thoughts. Yeah. I was doing some planning. Gotcha. Yeah, it was just really, I was at a place where I didn't feel safe. Yes, so that's the key, right? We say that all the time. Our top priority is safety. And yeah. whether that's, you know, other other individual safety or safety for ourselves and I think that's a big that's the biggest component of crisis stabilization for sure and that's really strong insight to have too because you know sometimes people struggle with chronic suicidal thoughts or chronic depression or chronic panic attacks and they just kind of get caught up in the cycle and don't have the moment of pause to realize I don't feel safe in my own body or I don't feel safe you know, with my thoughts or whatever that looks like. So that's big kudos to you for being aware of that. And it shows the work that you've done for sure. Mm-hmm. So our perception is reality. I use that saying all the time. So if that's my perception of myself or the world, it can be very, very, without those skills in place, it's hard to step outside of that and be able to to see those things. Yes. And I do just want to take a moment to... Um, share as far as suicidal thoughts how frequent they are um i wish that i would have like looked up research and gotten like actual numbers to share with you but Mm -hmm. the frequency of the thoughts happening i i mean i every pretty much every i mean i might have like a couple clients on my caseload that don't identify with it at all at any one time but 
But the majority of people have some sort of intrusive suicidal thought at some point in their life. And the fact that we've been living in a pandemic for three years or all of our bodies are in survival mode, traumatized, grieving, um, all sorts of things. So it's very normal response in our primal brain to say, this feels terrible. This feels like danger. The easiest option is to just not feel it at all. And this is how we do that. So it's really, I want to take the stigma away from it and understand that it's not about the thought, it's what we do with it. Yes. Yeah, what we do with the thought and addressing <clears throat> the, the motivators for the thoughts, like, because they can feel so consuming and we get caught up on, I had a client one time, we've already done a trigger warning, but in confidentiality, but in a nutshell, um, I remember this person was so overwhelmed in a moment um, with her children, multiple children. And in a moment, she had to, just a thought, not an urge, not a, like a thought that crossed her mind to harm one of the children. And immediately we spiraled into all kinds of um, unhelpful thoughts about herself as a person, as a mother, as all the things. So we, it's uh, super common, whether it's thoughts towards ourself or, or others when we get very overwhelmed. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's, Chris, let's get into or just your perspective a little bit on sure. the stigma that is tied to crisis hospitalization in general, or maybe if comfortable, some of the stigmas that you feel like you have faced or heard yourself. Yes. I mean, I've been in lives where people say, you know, I'm afraid to tell my therapist. XYZ because they'll send me to the hospital. And I really want us to destigmatize that to not be the hospital shouldn't be something to be feared. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's like it's a, bit, it's a big thing that leads people from they hold back. It's like maybe they have that insight we were talking about. Like they know yeah. this is something that they feel like they don't have control over or they don't feel safe. But then mm -hmm. withholding that information based on a stigma rather than and everybody you know we can in this episode we're only speaking on you know your experience and in yeah. general terms but those services are there for a reason and they're very much tied to mm -hmm. your and also um a good therapist doesn't just jump to the hospital yes you know, mine it was a multi-session process before it got to where that was necessary yeah I know, um, I I think I've even actually said this to a client at some point, like it was when I was working in the doctor's office. So maybe that white coat syndrome also had some kind of impact on it. But I would let people know that told me they were nervous about sharing those thoughts that it's not like as, as soon as you say I'm suicidal or I'm having this thought, I don't have like some red button that I push on my desk and the ambulance comes and gets you and takes you away and locks you up. Like that's, it's, it's a process for sure. Like you shared, Chris, it, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not just, you know, zero to a hundred. So, um, our number one concern is the safety of our client and our safety of the people around them. So, if at any point if we can't guarantee that with reasonable, you know, expectation that something will occur, then then we might have to jump to that. But thankfully, in all my time in the field, I have not had to, quote unquote, pink slip anybody or um, have anyone crisis stabilized at the hospital. And I know Kelsey and I um, have both done um, just for like therapists or professionals out there or even consumers, just so you're aware that this is a certification one of your providers can have. We are both CAMS trained. So that's the Collaborative Assessment Management of Suicidality. Um, and it really is a collaborative approach where you work with your therapist to not go to the hospital. Um, so really helpful. Yes. It's not necessary. <clears throat> it's like the that's the top priority of cams that's why i like it a lot is to we use the word it's not necessarily avoiding the hospital but it, i like how it targets it targets a lot of like i said earlier the in cams they call it drivers the things that are in my life that are driving or feeling those the suicidal thoughts and mm -hmm. very structured and I, and i'm sure chris i don't want to speak for you but was um, part of that process, the multi sessions that you had with your therapist was part of that a like safety planning or yes, we did safety planning, we did coping skills. This, the hospital was the last resort. Yeah, yeah, 
yeah, when we're doing things. Can you share, Chris, what um, I think it can be helpful for people um, for yes. anything, the more information, the better. Can you share what for you that experience looked like? Because I think oftentimes all we have is the movies and horror <laughs> stories about that. Um, and we don't see the the trauma informed places, the treatment, the, the good that comes out mm -hmm. of that. So if you're willing to share what that looked like for you. Sure. I was in a session with my therapist and, you know, being honest, mm -hmm. which I have to say, I don't regret at all. I would do the same, do it the same way again. And she's just asking me questions, it's boring. And finally, it got to the point where we agreed that I need to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So she um, called the police and had, um, oh, I don't know what the his title is, but he was a crisis. He was trained in crisis. Nice. Yeah. And Usually they're, they're like a CIT officer, like a crisis. I, yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. the word, CIT yeah. officer. Um, so he just came. I was not put in handcuffs. Every, it was explained to me, you know, the process and what would happen. And then he took me to the hospital. Um, at the point where I did get to the hospital, they did take all my belongings, my phone. And then really just waited there until their um, pre-screener came. And she evaluated me and then she talked, spoke to the doctor and they agreed I need to be admitted. And then from there, I was taken up to the unit and, you know. So it was a long day. Um, they were meeting four people at the same time. So I was in the ER for about 11 hours. Yes, yes, that's in our, that's unfortunately yes. a frustrating reality sometimes and right. <clears throat> feel very defeating. Uh, yes. Waiting. So, but even though you waited 11 hours, yes. it seems like it was an okay experience and helpful. Do you mind sharing once you got up to the unit, what that experience was like? Like what, what would someone expect? Um, like living quarters wise, safety wise, groups or treatment, food, like all the things that someone <laughs> would think about, right? Um, well, I got to you and it was quite late, so I just went straight to bed. Um, um, they, they, one little hiccup was they didn't have my meds ordered, so I couldn't get any meds that night. Mm -hmm. um, I got up the next day, you know, they had breakfast for me, it was hospital food. Um, mm -hmm. I was in a room with another roommate. It just looked like just like a dorm room. Yeah. You know, it's not in the movies, right? Like we, a lot right. of listeners will be thinking of movies. So it's not this um, stigmatized, the padded room. No. Like no, be completely, you know, isolated. Like it oh, doesn't no. feel that way. No. Mm -hmm. And then did they have you engaging in like group or, you know, things like uh, activities on the unit? Um, they did have group once a day. Mm -hmm. It was really just something educational, coping skills, anger management. Um, we weren't required to attend, but we were encouraged. And then you saw the psychiatrist once a day to adjust your meds or, you know, working on being discharged. Yeah. And, you know, everybody's length of stay, that's just yes. client by client, right? Just kind of based on yeah. what needs are, and it's not a, a blanket approach. Right. Everybody. Yeah, there were some people that were just in and out in a couple of days, and then there was one lady that was there, had been there for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was very individualized. Yes. And, you know, everyone was compassionate and understanding. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they're stepping into their role and what they're there to do. You yes. know, your experience was was very good. Those people were, were there, very supportive. Yes. And, and um, that treatment team approach sounded like it was pretty strong in there. Yes. I'm sure you had like a 
a social worker or a therapist. And I heard you mention the psychiatrist and then groups if you wanted to. Yes. Mm. It's coming to mind like, mm-hmm. well, duh. Like if you had like a kidney surgery and you were feeling better and you could walk the next day and you were urinating or whatever all the things they asked for you to do (laughs) and you get to go home the next day whereas somebody else then gets a secondary infection and has to stay there longer Mm -hmm. right it's just very and I think hospitals do it very well in that medical model but sometimes they lose the person yeah but it's really beautiful when they can pair the two of that structure making sure everything is checked and also providing the humanity part yeah and they were in touch and working with my um, outpatient mental health team, too. Yes, that. And I know in a, in a minute, I think we'll get into that that experience as far as if there's any other benefits. I didn't want to make you jump ahead, but no. any benefits that you feel like came from hospitalization and that experience for you? Um, I mean, they adjusted my meds a little bit, but mostly what they did is just give me a timeout. Uh, yeah, I like that. I like that wording, kind of like a reset. Yeah. Like, let's take yes. a look at, look at you as a whole person. Yes. Kind of take like a sabbatical from all the stress in your life. Yeah. <laughs> Only focus on self care. Yeah. And that real, I really feel that helped to stabilize me, where I that could safely you. go home. Yeah, I love that you brought that up because it's not to be looked at as like an as like a an escape like it's a it's quite literally can for many it's like a reset take me out of this space that is possibly very triggering or um has a lot of the drivers for those thoughts and give me a space where I can reset regroup come up with this plan all the way through post-discharge which can lead us into that area as far as um the important piece of with stabilization comes aftercare and yes. those things that come after I get out of the hospital. So do you have any maybe like tips or like positive aftercare experiences or, you know, to kind of highlight that important piece and what it looked like for you? Um, well, I made sure I had appointments with my psychiatrist and my therapist, which I did. And then I got home on Sunday and I saw my therapist on Tuesday and then my psychiatrist on Wednesday. So it was very seamless. And having those set up, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a tickle in my throat. <clears throat> having those set up like right away or as soon as obviously those people had availability, but those yes. slots take priority. So it's like, okay, knowing when I get out, I'm not just, I've, I've heard so often feeling like I'm just being thrown back to the wolves, right? I get out and I thought that experience was great. It was so beneficial. And then I, I don't want to feel like I'm completely alone and having bridged that gap. Yes. I didn't feel that way at all. So. So was there Mm -hmm. that also, I know we talked about safety planning earlier, but was there a plan for Sunday through Tuesday? Um, yeah, I mean, just to take my meds and use my coping skills. And then they sent me home with numbers to call and text if I needed crisis services again. And for wrap up and in the show notes, we'll put put those resources as well. The crisis talk line and the uh, the call line and the text line and any other crisis resources will. Have you heard? They're coming out with this, I think it's 988. It's like 911, but for mental health crisis. No, this year, that, later this oh, year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah later. It's, I, I don't know if it was June or, I just remember seeing the notice the other day. So yeah, that's very exciting. That is exciting. So yeah. happy. I often think that, I don't know, I feel like that'd be helpful because for some reason, like calling a long 1-800 number or texting one of those numbers is like, there's a disconnect between that and like a 911 or a 988. Seems like it'd be much easier to follow through on for some reason in my brain. You know, and you're calling some like uh, somebody that is, and we're doing, we're we're trying to reform. We're trying, you know, to make, you know, having the crisis intervention officers and 
and things like that, but it's not it's not a streamlined across the board kind of thing that's in place right now everywhere. And I love that they're putting a, a specific line in place so that those individuals know that when they call, they're getting somebody mm-hmm. who responds, who is educated, informed, and competent that is going to be showing up for them. Yes. Thanks for sharing that. Amanda. I'll include, I'll try to find a link or something about that and put it in the show notes too for everyone. Um, but Chris, thank you. That was super oh. helpful to see a firsthand experience of what that looks like mm-hmm. from therapist office to hospital to back to your therapist office. Um, we really appreciate you coming to help destigmatize because mental health is health, right? Yes. <laughs> we shouldn't even have to be talking about this. It's just the health of your brain, not the health of your heart or, you know, whatever else. So, um, is there anything, we always ask all our guests, so not to put you on the spot, make you feel pressured um, if you don't have something, but is there a mantra that like keeps you going? Is there anything you want to say to our audience before we close out today? Um, if they're struggling with something like this or just anything on your mind? Just not to be afraid to be honest with your therapist. Yes, yes, yes. Like that's what we're here for. And you know, the, the compassionate, you know, approach with you, not against you. Yes, I never felt like it was something that was being done to me or it's being punished. And I also wanted to say I appreciate you sharing that CIT officer experience because um, there can be, again, a disconnect. I saw it when I worked in the criminal justice system, you know, when the POs or the courts were involved, it became punitive and then it got associated with treatment, which was rough. So like being picked up by a police officer might seem a little traumatizing. So I appreciate that you shared that and I wish there was more of them. Um, yes. Just more news. I think that they're going to be trying to hire more social workers within the police departments too, which I think would be amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. So again, thank you, Chris. We appreciate you being okay. here and sharing your experience. This is one of the most difficult things to do. You know, I I, I have to say honestly, many of our guests come from a professional realm. Um, it's very, I'd mm-hmm. say the the minority is personal vulnerability, but those are some of the most powerful to me. Not that I don't love our experts and what they talk about, but um, the personal story is beautiful. So thank you for that. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Next week, for everyone listening, uh, make sure you subscribe um, so you get notifications of the next episode. But we're going to be talking to Miranda Campbell. She, I believe, works in a private practice and she's going to be talking about boundaries and intimate relationships. So that should be a good one. We don't talk too much about relationships. And uh, everyone have a wonderful week and we'll see you next Sunday. Take care everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.